we are here to share at least, you know, um, perhaps just learn more about who or rather what is the way of the little way. And, and I put the title here, The Love That Keeps Us Sane, because we are living in a world that seems to be going haywire. You know, we're going on a roller coaster up and down, especially in the past uh, nearly two years of our life. You know, it's, it's really a crazy situation that we are in. And most of us are, you know, for the, more, for the majority part of it, we are actually locked indoors. We can't go out, we can't leave, we can't go anywhere. And it's, in a sense, driving us crazy. Well, how do we actually maintain our sanity in the midst of all this, um, all this difficult situation? So this, is, this, this little way can help us to actually maintain somewhat our composure. Now, do not be deceived by the word little way. It is anything but little. It's just that um, littleness is about simplicity. But in simplicity itself, it is very, very difficult. As you will see later, you know, the different ways that, that she used. It's, it's, just, it's just little because it's little in the eyes of the world. The, the world sees it as something which is insignificant. But if, when you look at it from the spiritual point of view, it is something which is really not easy to practice. But first of all, before we go into that, just for some of us who do not know who St. Therese is, just a little brief introduction. If you want to read about whole life, I suggest you read the story of a soul or just find some information about her. But briefly, St. Therese was born in 1873. Her parents... She was actually one of the youngest child born. Um, her parents are also now saints, uh, Zeli, Martin, and uh, what was the father's name? I can't remember now, sorry. I, I am not good with the, the, the name, the name, but her, her parents are also saints now. Now, so, so she, from a very young age, she's a very active child, but when her mother died at the age of four, she became timid and reserved. So her whole life was a after that it was a series of uh, difficulties in terms of meeting with people and emotional difficulties. So she had to go through a lot of emotional struggles from when she was four until about ten, when she when she had the conversion at Christmas. So all these experiences also led her to the love of God. And to lead, let her to believe that, you know, it, God is love and not otherwise. I will explain uh, later why, did, why I say this. But nevertheless, when her elder sister Pauline, whom she took as her second mother after her mother died, decided to enter Carmel, she also said, I too will enter Carmel. At the end, I think she was like five or six. I don't think she knew what exactly was talking about. But she said with such conviction that I too would enter Carmel, even though she didn't know what it was. She just wanted to follow Pauline, her elder sister. And so, but Pauline's entry into Carmel really devastated her. And then when her, another sister entered the convent, it also really devastated her. So she, she was really, she needed a lot of love which these two sisters provided, but, you know, they left, and so she felt lost. And so she always had to recourse to the divine, turning to God and Mother Mary. So at the age of six, 15, she entered the Carmel of Dissu. Even her entry was actually difficult. She wanted to enter, enter earlier. She even went to the Pope to ask for his uh, intervention. But the Pope said, if it's God's will, you will enter. And so she did at the age of 15, which is young. Normally at that time, they accept only when she's 16. Nevertheless, she entered it at the age of 15. And a year later, she took on the, the habit of a novice. And later, then after that, she made her first vow. And um, not long after that, when she was 23, 22 or 23, she contracted tuberculosis, what we now have. We, what we know now is tuberculosis, but at that time it was, you know, it was not really known. So, at that, at the final moments of her life, she started, at the request of her sisters, she started writing her story because she said she has a lot of memories that she always tell during recreation. And so her sister says, "Why not ask her to write it down for us to read?" 
So the story of a soul is actually what she wrote during the last years of her life. And it's not meant for public viewing, actually. It's more meant for her sisters. But now we have access to the autobiography. So if you ever read it, just bear in mind that it is something very personal and it's written in during the context of that time, you know, late 19th century. So it, you cannot read it with a mindset of 21st century. You have to read the mindset of that century in a French setting. Because when I first read it before I entered Carmel, honestly, I can tell you I wanted to throw the book to the wall. It was really difficult for me to read. But I gradually learned to appreciate her writing, her simplicity. And so this is the person who, through her life, through her time in the monastery, found a way to live life without losing her sanity. You imagine you are in a monastery, cloistered monastery, you can never leave. There are 20 women inside for the rest of your life. You know, sooner or later, it will drive you crazy. So she managed to find ways to keep herself sane. And this, these are the bits and pieces that we find from her autobiography and her last conversation. Now, little, she always pictured herself as a little child. You know, in the arms of God, she is God the Father and she is the little child of God who, and she uh, totally abandoned herself to God as that child, knowing that God will take care of her and she, in her weakness and feebleness, will not be able to ascend to heaven unless God brings her up. And so this is what she says. Our Lord's love is revealed perfectly in the most simple soul that resists his grace in nothing as in the most excellent soul. In fact, since the nature of love is to humble oneself. Sorry, hold on. I'm sorry, hold on. Uh, if all souls remember those of the holy doctors who illumine the church with the clarity of their teaching, it seems God would not descend so low when coming to their hearts. But he created a child who knows only how to make his feeble cries heard. It is to their heart that God deigned to lower himself. When coming down in this way, God manifests his, this infinite grandeur. So what she's saying is, God's love is revealed perfectly in everyone. Whether you are intelligent, you're a doctor of the church, you're a saint, you're a child, you're, you're someone simple, you're a housewife, whatever state of life you are in, God will still reveal his love perfectly in our souls to us. As long as we open ourselves to him. And as if you, if you have gone for Mass for the Feast of St. Therese, the Gospel itself talks about the greatness of a little child. The little child is the one who will enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's not about being childish, but being childlike. To have that trust in the Father who know, whom we know loves us very much. Now, just give, give you a background uh, of the time of St. Therese. Now, during that time, the, there was a heresy called Jansenism, which is basically uh, what it teaches is the body is evil. You know, uh, the soul is good. So you, you have, in order to make yourself holy, you have to punish yourself. So at that time, so it, it really focuses a lot on all these uh, you know, bodily things like flagellation and fasting and whatnot and whatever that makes you uncomfortable. So it, it was raging at the time. People had this fear of God that God was a judge who opened his account book and everybody named it with the thing. So every, every type of punishment do to yourself, you know, like it sort of like blot out that sin. So, so they were living in fear and they, they didn't, they saw God as a punisher. I think this, this, even this, when I was growing up in the 80s and in the 90s, this thought still prevailed somewhat when, when I was you know, learning catechism in school. And I, traces of this still can still be found in the world today. So this, this fear didn't allow people to realize that they are children of God. I mean, if you look at scripture, it clearly tells us we are the children of God. You the gospel, the letters of Paul, the letters of St. John, 
Everything says we are the beloved of God. We are the children of God. And therefore, we should not fear God. You know, he is the loving father who we can go to, not someone whom we fear who's always holding the rotan. And so this is why for St. Therese, God is merciful love, not, for, not someone who's always punishing. Jesus himself revealed that God to us. And the thing is, with that kind of attitude, because Therese also grew up in a very loving family, she was surrounded by so much love, actually, which is really quite unusual in these days. So she was able to get involved in the in a life and the life of the people without being so being drawn into it, without being trapped into it. So she, in a sense, she was able to live live life fully without being drawn or trapped by other people. And she knew how to love others without being entangled in their problems, especially in the monastery. And so she was able to deal with the absurdities of life without losing her, her, you know, her sanity. And so life is, can sometimes be very absurd. We know that a lot of craziness, but you know, she was able to, to, to deal and live with that. So there are six aspects that I'm going to share with you tonight about this so-called little way. Now, the first thing is secrets. Now, you wouldn't think that secret is something that can keep us sane, but there are different types of secrets. Now, basically, there are two types of secrets. One is dark and one is the normal one. Dark secrets are what we normally uh, encourage to share, at least to someone we trust. Because dark secrets can be something that we keep from other people that we don't want people to know. But the more we keep those dark secrets inside us, the more it festers, the more it eats up our soul, and it will eventually drive us crazy. I don't know how many of you have actually watched the, the series or movies called Star Wars or even uh, Lord of the Rings. Because in Star Wars, there's this menacing big fellow called Darth Vader. So how did he become that? He, he started actually as an innocent little boy who was happy and joyful and helping other people. But he grew up to this, become this mechanical person who, who just hunted people and hate, filled with so much hatred. Because he had this secret that he couldn't, uh, was not able to share with other people. And that actually drove, tore him apart psychologically. So some secrets, even though it is difficult for us that we want, we don't, we think it's, it's uh, people will look at it in a different way. We have to share with others. Otherwise, it will drive us apart as well, which is why confession, spiritual direction is necessary because these are the avenues that we can share our dark secret with. Because for us priests, there is that seal of confession. We don't, we don't go and, go and uh, gossip around. So that is a dark secret. Now, the other secret is the, the, the good one. And this is what we have to be careful about. Now for St. Therese, if you look at this picture, those who are familiar with her story, she fell sick at about the age of 10, right? And um, the doctors could not diagnose what it was. They didn't know. All the doctors, they tried to diagnose, they tried to give her medication, but nothing worked. She, she was just in anxiety all the time. She was confined to bed. She had fever. She had all kinds of things. And some doctors even attributed to the attack of the devil. Right? Even medical science couldn't cure her. So one day, she cried all in pain. And so Marie, her second sister, was there. And so she started to, in her room, there was a statue of Our Lady of Victory or Our Lady of Smile. So she, Marie went to kneel at the statue and started praying for Our Lady's intercession to heal Therese. At that time, Therese saw a bright light coming from the statue towards her. If you can look at the picture, that one of the depictions. And she said, she saw, okay, this is what, what she said. This is, this is what she said in her uh, story. All of a sudden, the Blessed Virgin appeared beautiful to me. Ah, I thought the Virgin smiled at me. How happy I am. But never will I tell anyone for my happiness would then disappear. So this is from story of a soul. Now, this is a secret that 
she only knew because that happened to her only. Marie couldn't see it. But she knew that, you know, if she had, if she want to share with this, it would disappear. Now, why? Um, okay, before I get to the why. But she shared it with Marie, her sister, because she loved Marie very much. So she shared with her this experience of her, her healing from this Our Lady of Smile. And Marie said, why not share it with the nuns of DCU, the, 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 the Carmelite nuns? She was reluctant because she knew that if she did that, she would not feel the happiness and the joy of this experience anymore. But because she loved Marie very much, so she contented and said, okay, let's go and, go and share this experience. So you can imagine a little girl of maybe 10 years old going to a monastery, maybe 20 nuns, different ages, and you share the experience to them. It's like you bring a little child now to Kamo in Kuching or Kamo in Miri or whichever Kamo, and you ask them to share the experience. It's quite a scary experience at least. And I don't know whether the nuns are listening or not. So, but uh, if, if you are listening, please don't fault me for when I say all these things. Uh. Uh, but you know for a fact that sometimes when we have recreation with the nuns or when we speak to them, sometimes we share our experience and they, they out of their, they, they want to clarify certain things. So they will ask a lot of questions. So the more, the more Therese shared the story, the more questions she got. And she felt so confused by all the questions because they were all like very tiny, tiny details. You know, like what color was the veil of Mother Mary? What did she look like? What, what color was her clothes? What did she wear? No, all these kind of things like, come on, la. the most important thing, the experience. So, but, but she, she became confused and she began to doubt that she experienced it at all. And so when that happened, her happiness totally disappeared. So, uh, just as she predicted, she, she, she lost that joy of that whole experience. So when, when we try to share something which is not easily shared, it, it, is, it is very difficult because then what we are trying to communicate will sometimes be lost, the joy of it at least. Because all of us will have our own convergence story or our, our own spiritual experiences during prayer or through, you know, during healing sessions. And sometimes those experiences are just meant for us. You know, it's not meant for other people to hear. Sometimes for the good of the other people, in order to help them, yes, we share. But sometimes it is meant for us personally. And these are the things that we need to keep to ourselves. Because here, it, Therese calls it the memory of grace. It is a memory because we remember it as an event but not, no longer it's as a joy. Because once you share it, the joy is lost. It becomes a normal everyday event. But when we keep it to ourselves, we, we know it's a grace-filled moment at that point where we receive the grace of God. Which is why sometimes when people say, forgive and forget, we should not. You forgive, yes. You don't forget. What you don't forget? You forget the... the, the causes of the argument or whatever it is but we do not forget the grace that God has given us at that point to forgive that is the grace that we need to remember that is the moment that we, we need to remember and that is something that we can go back to when we are faced with difficult or emotional challenges for me personally when I was about 18 years no 19 years old and I went through a bad series of uh, difficulties, always questioning God and doubting God's existence. So I, I went for a healing session and there I, I obtained, uh, I, I, I had a very, very, very strong healing experience of the love of God in my life. And that became my focal point, my memory of grace. In a sense that, that, that even though I'm sharing with you now, I can still feel the, the emotion that I felt at that time. Right. And because the, 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 the experience is so strong. And whenever I have doubt over difficulties, especially in my vocation as a Kamalite, as a priest, I will always go back to that event, knowing that God is there for me. 
God will be there to heal me. And that, I know, is my anchor point. And that is a memory that we should preserve because that is the one that can help us to maintain our sanity. Much damage is incurred when one secret is exposed to this inquisitive world. We know all this. The moment we, we just tell somebody, we just have to tell somebody, hey, I tell you this, are you going to tell, don't tell anybody else. Uh, uh, that's it. Bye-bye. It's like telling to the reporter, the whole world will know. So people are inquisitive. That is true. You know, people love to gossip. People love to, hey, what, what happened? Normal human nature. But when we, when we share freely, it also damages us. We don't share... Uh, we don't share the dark secret also destroys us. So we have to find the balance between what, what to share and not what to share. Because one extreme is we close, totally close up, we don't share anything. Good secret, bad secret, we all, we don't want to share. On the other hand, you just go and tell everybody in the world. Just go and tell whoever wants to listen, tell, 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 tell. That is also bad. Because then everybody will start talking about us and you know that pointing fingers and you will be like, oh you know what 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 you know. So it, it is the two extremes. We need to find a balance when to share and when not to share. So in a sense, when we when we share the thing, it's because we need to so that we free ourselves from being trapped. But when we want to preserve that memory of grace, then this is what the rest called living a hidden life, where we hide from the world. We exist in the world, but we, we do not be we do not make ourselves prominent by by you know, getting everybody's attention. So that is the first one. And that brings us to the second point: finding our way in life. We keep our secrets, we, you know, we share or we secret, but then what? How do we actually navigate the, the, the ways of life without the danger of going insane or losing our way? Which way to go? This represents the choice of Sinteret to live before the eyes of the world, but not drawing anything, any attention to herself. Now, we know that in the world these days, everybody clamors for attention. We have TikTok. We have you. You TikTok is all the rage now. You know, in in uh, China, we have things like Weibo and and uh and all the other platform. They sole attention is to draw attention to themselves. They look at me. Even Facebook is the there's a gender there in Facebook. We we put things on Facebook. Why? To attract attention. To get like. People don't like. Why? Why people don't like? Huh? We put Instagram, people don't like, they thought, why? Uh? Is it not nice? Is it, is it my picture bad? Do I look ugly? You know, but why? Why do we need to draw attention to ourselves? It is really unnecessary. So, this is uh, one of the things that I mentioned, the background about gentleness and how they try to practice. Uh, we call this, uh, uh, I can't remember the term now. So she basically you are supposed to just you know uh do uncomfortable thing to try and uh, all this we call it ascetical practices. So one of the prominent practices at that time in Karma was to wear an iron cross with sharp prongs against her bare chest. So we all most of us wear a cross, a metallic cross, and it's on our chest. But this one is there's sharp thorns, you know. So you actually she poking against her chest. And this is very, very painful. And she tried to do that because that was the prevalent practice at the time. To Everybody was doing it. So if you don't do it, uh, people will think something wrong with you. But she said, and this one she told, uh, she told it to her sister. Uh, she said, she told me how she wore her, her little iron cross for a long time and that it made her sick. He told me too that it wasn't God's will for her, nor for us to throw ourselves into great mortification. This sickness was a proof of it. This is, this is one of the experiences that led her to believe that God doesn't demand all these things from us. Why, why would, if God is a loving God, 
why would God demand out we we hurt ourselves to you know to cause ourselves pain? Yes, in the early days of the church, the church fathers or the different saints, they do mortification to to ward off sin or at least to to help them to prevent them from falling into the sin of the flesh. But it's, it, this is it is done like, you know, in, in, in the extreme already. To prove your holiness, you have to do this. If you don't do this, you're not holy. But for the rest, this cannot be true. Because if God is someone who's loving, then why, do you, why does God want to make people sick? Now, so after that, she stopped wearing it. But she didn't know what to do. You know, she was in Carmel. And since that was the practice at the time, she said, if I don't follow, what, what way do I follow then? You know, to leave my vocation as a Carmelite. Others are doing this. What am I going to do? And she struggled for many months. She, she really struggled to find her place in Carmel. So one day out of desperation, she went to in, the infirmary, the uh, billet sake. And she, she wanted to talk the, to the previous mother superior. But when she went there, there were already two sisters there uh, visiting her. That was the maximum for, for uh, visiting. So she left quietly. But the previous mother superior saw her and she, she said this to her. Serve God with peace and joy. Remember my child. Our God is a God of peace. And this message convinced her that when we serve God, when we are trying to find our way in life, we don't have to do it with a sour face. We don't have to, you know, like punish ourselves because we serve God with peace and joy because our God is a God of joy. It's a God of peace, a God of love. That is what we believe now. You know, we, and that is what we accept now. So when we serve God, when we try to find a way in life as a secular Carmelite or as a lay person in the church, just remember that we serve God with joy and peace. And Teresa Aguila tells us very clearly, God save us from sour face saints. You know, don't be that sour face until Assam also lose. Okay, so just be aware of that. We are, called, we are all called to live this hidden life. That means, that, means we live what, that means we live an authentic life, simple and without pretense. So we live as we are. We don't have to pre pretend to be whom we are not. And this is also currently a world, worldwide phenomenon, I, I would call it. Especially if you just look at social media, you will see that a lot of people pretend to be who they are not. I mean... Very simple example, even the phone has a beauty app now. A 50-year-old man or woman can transform themselves into a 30-year-old man or woman. You know, but it's not them. And uh, people do all kinds of things to become who they are not, simply to be accepted by the world. But we are not of the world. We are in this world, we, but we don't belong to the world. We belong to God. And so we live a life that is in conformity with God. And so if you want to do that, we have to live an authentic life as a disciple of Christ, a simple life, not pretending to be anything but who we are. No, people don't accept us. I mean, if people don't accept us for the bad thing, bad habit, we have to change. No, but if we, if we live ways, the ways of the gospel, which are contrary to the way of the world, then fine, do it. We can easily become lost in our practices of pen, uh, penances by, you know, by, by leading, by being led by pride, basically, actually. We, are, we become proud. But when we, when we do a lot of penances, when we do a lot of motivation, we go, we, and okay, and this is not on a, a finger pointing at anybody. Okay, this is a general statement. You know, we go for daily mass, Sunday mass, we say rosary, novena, all kinds of things kind of devotion, no, which is good, okay, which is all in, in itself is good, but there is a danger of becoming too prideful, 
we become proud because we'll be thinking we are all holy. We are doing this every day. We pray the rosary five times a day or we tell the divine office, things like that. So there is that danger. Even though we may not realize it, but slowly, slowly, we will begin to judge people. It's like, how come that person not doing it? How the person that person it? How come I can do it? The other person don't do it. We become judgmental. But that is not an authentic life. That is not the life that we are called to live. We are called to live that hidden life, which is what Jesus says in the gospel. When you pray, go into your room and pray in secret. And our Father in heaven will hear you. So we should don't have to show off to everybody that we are holy. And God knows we are not. Even then, we not, might not be holy. Pride leads to insanity because we fear the opinion of other people. Because the more we expose ourselves, the more we show ourselves, when we do all these things, we kneel for hours on the pew, adoration, or things like that. Then people's eyes will be on us all the time, trying to catch us. So then we fear that that will happen. Because oh, what if, people, what if I do this, what will people think of me? If I don't do this, what will people think of me? And so very soon, our minds will start to play tricks on us. We will see things that are not there. We will hear things that are not there. People say one thing and we misinterpret to be another thing. And sooner or later, that itself will also drive us crazy. Because we, 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 we start to, to become delusional. So the hidden life helps us to find our way in, in a way that helps us maintain our sanity. But we don't draw attention to ourselves. And uh, when we don't draw attention to ourselves, we don't have to fear other people's opinion. Now, this is one experience that Therese experienced in her monastery. She was actually made an sort of like assistant novice mistress unofficially to jaga the novices. So one day, one of the novices came and told her this, how her work was tiring her. Therese asked her how she felt when she was complimented for her work. The novice replied that she felt revived. So Therese told her that it's not the work that was causing her the fatigue. It was her need to have her work recognized that caused her fatigue. When we do things to gain approval of others, uh, we, we, we drain ourselves emotionally because we keep trying to get the approval of others. You know, when uh, recently I came, came across uh, one, of, one on YouTube, a vlog, this uh, young adult, uh, young lady, she, she, she was doing YouTube videos for years. Basically, a vlog, what they call a vlog, la, you know, lifestyle and things like that. But she said, the more she did it, the more anxiety she got. Because every time she did the video, she had to think of how to draw people to her videos, how to draw subscribers, how to make people like her videos, watch her videos. So when people don't approve, you know, then, then you get a thumb up or thumb down. That affects that, that their popularity and their income as well. And she said, finally, she decided to stop because it was causing her really, really unnecessary anxieties and stress. And it said, if she doesn't stop, she will just disintegrate emotionally. I, I mean, she, she made this video just to explain all this. So when it is the same for us, even for us, little, little thing. When, when we try to show, not say show off, we try to do things so that other people can praise us and things like that. We are, we are just doing harm to ourselves because the, the, more we, the more we want the approval of other people, the more we have to give. And uh, if we don't get any thanks, then we become very bitter, very angry. We don't have to go very far. If you are serving in the church, you know, serving in the church is a, thank, it's a thankless task. Nobody will kind of thank you, thank you for the work that you do. Very often, you get the opposite. Occasionally, you may get people thanking you or giving you information. But very often, I can tell you, you will just get a lot of uh, criticism and whatnot. So, but we have to ask ourselves, why are we doing it? Why are we serving in the church? Why am I doing this? Is it to get the approval of others? Is it so that the priest can praise me in front of a, a congregation? Or the priest can you know, give me a, you know, a thumbs up? These are the questions that we need to ask ourselves. Because we do work, yes. We are tired. Physically, we are tired. But emotionally, we are tired not because of the work. It's like what Therese said. 
is the need to have ourselves complimented. When we don't get people's compliment, when people don't thank us, then we become very bitter. We become very angry. Why nobody appreciate my work? And that really will bring down our, our energy. And, we, and you know, negative energy actually drains us very, very far. And we start to lash out at people. And it, up, eventually, we will just stop serving the church and leave because th we think that people don't appreciate us. But the most important thing is we do it because it is pleasing to God. We are called to serve God through the people. So as long as our work pleases God, that is enough. Easy to say, I know. I've been in church ministry for many years before I joined the Carmelite Order. And I know it's very difficult to have that kind of thinking all the time. But we need to calculate that, that kind of thinking so that we don't stress ourselves unnecessarily. And so by not drawing attention to ourselves, it prevents us from growing crazy and to help us to be more authentic to ourselves, to be more true to myself because this is who I am. This is what I'm comfortable with. I know what I'm doing. I don't have to get your approval just because you don't like what I do. As long as I know that I'm serving God in this way and it is correct, then it's, then it's fine. We can only see our real self in the eyes of God, you know, which is true because we are made in, in the image and likeness of God. Now, the next, the next one is about silence. Now, silence is a very difficult thing. Uh, one of the philosophers and mathematicians of the 19th century or 20th century said this is Blaise Pascal. He said, man's or humanity's greatest failure is their inability to sit still. It's very simple. You just go to a silent retreat or you go to a place where there's adoration. Those who, are, who can do adorations are the ones who really can sit down and sit still and keep silent. But you find some people who after one, two minutes start scratching here, scratching there, move here, move there, play their throat and scratch here, scratch there. Uh, these are the people who cannot, cannot take silence. One. But silence is something that can actually focus ourselves on God. And actually that actually helps us to, in a sense, recharge ourselves. <clears throat> now, the rest is this. He teaches without noise of words. Never have I heard him speak, but I feel that he is within me and at each moment. He is guiding me and inspiring me with what to say and do. Now, this, this kind of feeling, all of us will have experienced because sometimes we, we just seem to know what to do or what to say. You know, I'm giving you this talk now, okay, but I'm not having any paper in my hand. I'm just looking at my slide. I'm not talking just from my head, you know, because I know that at every given moment, God is there to guide me, right? Because sometimes when I, when I talk from the slide, some, something that I've never thought of will just come to me and, and I'll share it. You know? So for me, that is something which comes from God. And that is what Therese says. Also. This, this intuitive feeling that we have, this is from God. And it's only in the silence of our life that this thought will come. We, li we live in a world of noise. We, we, we cannot, and silence sometimes fears us, but it is only in the silence that we can hear the voice of God. Just like the prophet Elijah, when he went up to the mountain, God was not in the earthquake, he wasn't in the thunder, he wasn't in the storm, he was in the silence. And that's where we will find God. But silence, that is the silence of maintaining our self and our, our inner silence. But the other Silence is the exterior silence, which is when to speak and when not to speak. Silence is not a substitute for the courage to speak. So sometimes we think that we, we should be meek and humble. We don't talk you know, because we, are not a, we, 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 uh, we don't have the courage to speak. But it's not that. Very often, sometimes we find ourselves in situations that we either have to speak up or we don't. Therese was at, once had an experience when there was uh, another sister who was very close to the mother superior at that time, very close. So she felt that this wasn't right. She was also a junior, but she said, if I don't speak up, it is wrong. 
So she went to tell that sister that you shouldn't do this. You know, this is not healthy. And uh, the, the sister, of course, got up there. She began to cry and all that. I said, yeah, if, any, if mother, mother asks you why you cry, you can tell her, I told you this. So she's not afraid to voice out when it is not just. It is the same for us. When, when we need to keep silent, we keep silent. We need to know when to say things and when to keep quiet. Choosing our battles wisely. You know, you may win the battle, but you lose the war. So sometimes it's better to lose the battle and win the war. It's, so it, it's either, it, it will, we have to choose when to say things and when not to say things because it will either help us to keep our sanity or lose, lose our peace and sanity. The question is this, have, how often have we walked away winning an argument but losing our peace of soul? I'm very sure everyone can relate to this. We win an argument, also you die, die, also you want to win the argument. So you shoot, shoot, shoot everything you can. I need mean, you win. But does it leave us with peace of mind? This is for us to reflect. Because at least for me, Manu experience is very often, if I really die, die, so much win the argument, I know that I will, you will, you, I will lose my night's sleep. So which is why when this happens, if, if I overstep that, immediately I'll go and apologize. Otherwise, I will not have peace of mind. But this is something that we need to learn, when to hold our tongue and when to say it. And this is what St. Therese says, what good does it do to defend or explain ourselves? Let the matter rest and say nothing, O blessed silence that gives so much peace to soul. And I like this picture actually, it, 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 it put it very nicely. If you can't say nothing nice, don't say nothing at all. Which is true. If, 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 if our tongue uh, is, is very poisonous. One, one tongue come out uh, is worse than the, than the viper's tongue. But you, can, you don't kill the person, but you kill their soul. And so we have to learn to when to maintain our silence that, that can help us maintain our sanity and when we need to speak up so that it doesn't cost us our sanity. Because sometimes when we see something done which is not right, of course we have to speak up. Otherwise, we keep thinking about it because we say, oh, I should have done this, I should have done this, I should have made this right. And then, yes, we need to speak up. But if there are situations where if we speak up, we know we'll make the matters worse, then don't say. That's it. That can help us to actually keep our sanity and our peace of heart. Then uh, this is a very, very uh, difficult thing. Uh, minding our own business. We always like to, as Malaysia, jaga tapi kain orang on. We just like to go and artists, artists go and gossip, gossip and all that. But actually, what good does it do to us? You know, curiosity is, we're all curious people, it's like, but it's like a poison ivy. The more we scratch, the worse it becomes. Like, no, no, whole body also becomes like that. And so the more we become curious, the more we inquire into other people's business, sooner or later, nobody will come near to us. So minding our own business is to choose not to agonize over things that are beyond our control. A lot of things are beyond our control. Other people's life is not in our control. What we can control is our own life. What we do, what we decide. What other people do, that's their problem. They want to do, I mean, what can we do? Even St. Teresa says this in the way of perfection. He says, you know, what's the point of agonizing over, over your relative or your how they spend their money, everything like that. No point. What? They are not going to listen to you. So no point agonizing. So when we mind our own business, it eliminates the envy and resentment that comes from comparing ourselves with others. And, and it, it sums up very nicely in this quote. Life is easier when we mind our own, with, you know, we mind our own business. Sometimes we make our life more difficult than it should be. La. Now, the other thing is, of course, minding our own business does not, does not negate the commandments of Jesus, which is to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And this brings us to this sanity of loving freely. We may think that, you know, sometimes love do 
does hurt us. Yes, true. But we also have to see with what kind of love do we love that causes that hurt. Now, Therese was able to live in this state, same state of mind because she did not look for a reward. By focusing on her God assigned, not God assigned task and not concerned with the reward or gratitude, she freed herself from worry. So we need to let go of the need for results before we begin a task. The inner detachment can help us maintain our sanity. Now, what does this have got to do with love? Now, you know that the highest level of love is agape, right? the unconditional love. When we have unconditional love, when we love freely, of course, we will do everything freely. We will do things for the other person. We will serve the church with joy. And we don't, we don't look for reward. It's almost the same like just now when, when I say you know, we, we want to be complimented for our work and all that. Same thing here. We do work. Don't, don't, don't be concerned with the result. When we start something, we, we always start to think, oh, yeah, what will happen? Uh? What, will, what will the outcome be? Will this work? What will the people say? You know, things like that. So we are, we are always trying to think five, ten steps ahead. But we forget when we do that, we lose focus of the present. We lose focus of the journey that brings us towards that end. So if we don't focus on that, then we focus on what is in front of us, then it will help us maintain our peace of soul as well because we don't have to worry about what's going to happen next. Jesus himself said in the gospel, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries. Today has enough worries of its own. Let tomorrow worry about itself. And she says this in our last conversation. To the right and to the left, I throw to my little birds the good grain that God places in my hands. And then I let things take their course. I busy myself with it no more. Sometimes it is, sorry. Sometimes it is just as though I had thrown nothing. At other times it does some good. But God tells me, give, give always without being concerned about the result. I said she was actually assisting uh, the novice mistress in forming the novices. So whatever she had, you know, she, she give. She's not concerned about whether what she give is, will be sufficient or not. Whatever she had from God, she will give. So it's like the sower in the gospel. We are all called to be sowers in the gospel. We just, we, we can only sow the seed. But whether or not the seed broke, uh, you know, uh, bear good fruit or bad fruit or lousy fruit, that is not up to us for to us to decide. All we need to do is sow the seed. When we serve the church, when we serve people, we sow the seed. That is all. And we and we don't bother with it about anymore. Some people are just trying to you know, like worry about this. Okay, you know, if I do this, why no response? Or why this person like that? But again, is it really our problem? All we are, we are called to do is just spread God's love, God's message. That's it. I remember many, many, many years ago when I was asked to uh, share with a group of friends this uh, about a uh, topic. Then one of my friends asked me, Okay, convince me. I said, my job is not to convince you. I'm just here to share with you what I know. Convincing is the job of God. If God cannot convince you, no one else can convince you. So it's the same for us here. If we, are, if we put ourselves in the place of God, we are just giving ourselves unnecessary stress. So letting go of the need for result is to let go of unnecessary concern or worry. The rest attained peace because she was able to differentiate the right kind of care from the wrong kind of care. So what's the difference then? The right kind of care is to pay attention to what we do, the task that we are doing. When we focus too much on the result, sometimes we don't pay attention to what we do because we, we just, we just absentmindedly do, 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 do. Wrong kind of care is worrying about the outcome. Which is why I said, when you worry about the outcome, we don't focus on the thing in front of us. When we give, when we sow the seed, it also depends on our disposition. Do we give freely out of our own willingness or we give grudgingly? It's like, okay, la, okay, la, I do, I do, I do. You know, we, we quit that situation sometimes, but 
Sometimes we give grudgingly because we feel that we are not willing to part from the thing that we're supposed to give. Something has been taken away from us, our time, our energy, or whatever it is. And that is something that we are not willing to give up. But when we are asked to do it, say, okay, 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 I do it, I do it. But that, that is not loving freely. When that happens, we become resentful. And that actually festers in our soul as well. In this inwardly designed to give before being asked how to get rid of this grudging feeling. So when we have decided to give, then it becomes easier. We choose to give, not because we want to, because we have to, or because we need to, we choose to. There's a lot of whole, whole world of different. Different words meaning different things, but when I choose to give, then it's given freely, 100%, without reservation. I give, and I don't think about it anymore. In choosing to give and live love freely, we free ourselves from the animosity that inflict us. It is frees us from being consumed by our feeling. Our feelings come down can be very, very, very strong, especially when we are we feel that we've been taken advantage of and it will consume us really. But that's why we say choose to give. And St. Paul also says, God loves a cheerful giver. So give, give cheerfully. And this, of course, brings us to the perspective of divine charity because love in itself, as humans, of course, we know our love is imperfect. God's love is perfect. So when we are giving, we are loving, we are charitable, it has to be done from a divine perspective, not our human perspective because it is flawed. But when we give from divine perspective, we see from the eyes of God instead of the eyes of humanity. For St. Therese, we deprive ourselves of happiness when we are critical of others and make, don't, don't make the effort to set, see others in the light of charity. Being able to think and see in charity is a costly grace. This is the fruit of acting in charity toward those who trigger our strongest dislike. Now, we, when, we, when we are critical of others, we are always, we are always, okay, I'll tell you a story. Lah. Okay, now, this one, this one, this man went to see a, a, a pastor telling about the problems that we have. You know, he's not able to, to be very charitable. So the pastor said, okay, look out the window, what do you see? He said, I see a group of children playing. Then he hold up a, a coin in front of his eyes, blocking the window. Now what do you see? He says, I see the coin. Very often, this is what we see. We see the coin, we don't see the children. Which is why we are always critical. Because we, we cannot see beyond ourselves. We cannot see beyond what is blocking our eyes. That is not the light of charity. That is the light of selfishness. Which is why when we want to give, we want to give freely, is really something very costly. It costs us, yes. Costs us our time, costs us. And it's, it's, it's a really, we need a lot of grace to be able to do that. And this is one of our experience. Now, this one, in, the, in her autobiography, it's sorry of a soul, one of her experience was that she was assigned to look after a very elderly nun. Now, she can't, she, she needs help. I mean, she needs to be, brought from her room to the makam place, help her to sit down, you know, uh, and then, uh, you know, help her up again, bring her back to her room, things like that. Now, this particular elderly nun, very, very difficult, you know, everything also she criticizes her. Too slow, she say, why so slow? Too fast, she say, why you too fast? You know, cannot help properly, why you do like this? What you do, she, everything you do cannot please her. And St. Therese, for many months, she, she, kept to that task, you know, always gonna, and many times she, the elderly son told Therese, I knew you were not the right person to help me. You're so weak, you're so slow, you're this, you're, you're not considerate. But she did it nevertheless. She never complained. She did it with charity, with divine charity. And this is what she shared uh, with her sister, who, who became priors at, uh, the mother priors at the time already. She says, this year, dear mother, God has given me the grace to understand what charity is. 
I understood it before, it is true, but in an imperfect way. I had not fathomed the meaning of these words of Jesus. The second commandment is like the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Dear mother, when meditating upon these words of Jesus, I understand how imperfect was my love for the sisters. Ah, I understand now that charity consists in bearing the faults of others, in not being surprised at their weakness, in being edified by the smallest acts of virtue we see them practice. But I understand above all that charity must not remain hidden in the bedroom of one's heart. Jesus has said, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel basket, but upon the lampstand, so as to give light to all in the house. We are that light. And who is the one who lights us? God. God is the one who lights us. We are the lamp lighted by God. And when God gives us that light, it is the light of divine charity, not our own charity. We are just reflecting the love of God. So why do we withhold our love from other people or give to those whom we like only and we don't give to the people we don't like? I don't like this person. I don't want to, I don't want to go. I, I don't like how she talks. I don't like how she behaves. I don't want to go. I don't want to charm this fellow. Uh, she, they talk very weird, uh, very strange. But we are all called to be that light. And she says precisely uh, to give light to all in the house not just to this person or that person, to give to everybody. So my question is, why are we still not behaving like that light, that divine light that gives light to everyone? So this brings me to the final point, which is an attended life, an authentic life. Here, the, the quote also, I found it very good. It says, Authenticity is freedom from the illusion of fear and alignment to the reality of love. When we are authentic, when we live ourselves authentically, we free ourselves from fear, uh, fear, from what other people think of us, from what we think of ourselves. Because sometimes we also think badly of ourselves. But when we know we live an authentic life, we are being true out to ourselves. And who are we? We are the children of God. We have many regrets in our life. Right? We, this is true. And we, but we go, often go through life in a state of sleepwalking, which is also true. We, that's why sometimes we never pay attention to what we do because we are just planning to do what's next. So we, we eat, but we are thinking of what to do next. And when we are doing something, we are thinking what to do next. We are always living in the future. We are never living in the present. And so we are essentially sleepwalking through life. Just, life is just passing by. Just, uh, we don't know what's going on around us. And if I wrote here, the soul's biggest regret that he hasn't heeded his true vocation, which is a call to love. Now, Benedict, Pope Emeritus Benedict the Sixteenth, in his uh, Antarctical Deus Caritas as God is Love, he says that man who is created in the image and likeness of God, is able to love because of this fact. No, because we are created by God who is love, so we are able to give that love, which is the love of God. And so the, in the deepest part of our soul, like it or not, we know we are exactly made in the image of likeness of God, and our soul is created to love freely, to give this love of God to everyone. And if we are really true to ourselves, if we are really believe that we are in the image of likeness of God, then when we, when we do not heed our vocation to love freely, then we should really regret. Because sometimes we can fix that problem. We can you know, rectify certain problems, but some regret we can't. Unfortunately, the English only have one word for regret. If you look at the Chinese, it's actually two. Uh, it gives a different nuance. So, which is why sometimes you look at the Mandarin word, uh, it's, it's easier to differentiate between the two regrets. Okay, this, I, I, I've said this already. So, uh, I, I've said this also. To love is a fearful thing. It robs us of what we cling to, our energy, our emotion. But by not loving, we deprive ourselves of God who is within us. 
true. We love to, we fear to love simply because there are many things that we cling to, that we attach ourselves to. When we start to love, we have to let go of certain things. The hands which are, cro are the hands which holds a lot of things cannot love because in order to love our hands will be to be free. But when our hands are free, we have to let go of a lot of things. And sometimes these are the detachments that we need to let go of. If you read John the Cross, the Saint Mount Carmel, that he speaks of all these detachments, even of temporal goods or spiritual goods, of all kinds of goods, so that we free ourselves to love. What we give out is given back to us. This is also in from the gospel. What we withhold, we withhold from other people as well. So in order to remain sane, we need to be rooted in God's life and love. And here, Therese puts it very aptly. Perfection consists in doing his will, in being what he wills us to be. God does not expect us to be something that we are not. God asks us only one thing of us, and that is for us to love. And love is not beyond our grasp, because we all of us have this capacity to love. And that is all we are asked to do. Jesus himself said the greatest commandment is what? Love God, love neighbor. Everything else is just commentary. Everything else is a result of that two commandments. If we cannot love God and love neighbor authentically, then everything else do, we do is actually in vain. And to love is an expression of an authentic life, an authentic life as a child of God. Love is always, uh, it's always concrete. It's, it's not something up in the air. It's, some, it's expressed in our actions, our words, the things that we do. It's something that we can see, something that's tangible. It's not abstract. It's not vague. It's not a vague mood. It's always a choice. It is this love of God dwelling in our actions that make us sane. So it is this love that will always keep us sane. Because in all that we have said, you know, secrets and everything and silence, everything we do it is because of the love of God that is residing in us. St. Paul tells us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that is what we are. But do we treat ourselves as the temple of the Holy Spirit? Sometimes we don't. We treat ourselves like the market in the in, in the in the in the in the town. So if we are truly the temple of the Holy Spirit, if we truly have that love of God within us, we claim to be children of God, then we have to love. And like Therese said, God doesn't expect a lot of us. He doesn't expect us to be who we are not. We don't have to be superhero or do superhuman things or heroic things. All we need to do is love. That's all. Love will help us to do many other things. And so I'd like to share with you as a, in closing a poem. Now, this poem, some people attribute to Mother Teresa, but she did not write this. This was found hanging in the office. Some of you may know this. Now, the poem goes like this. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motive. Don't be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and make some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. Well, you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Guess. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some people may be jealous. Yeah. Be happy anyway. La. It's not their problem. What? The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. La. I mean, there are so many people who have done good in the past. They are forgotten also. What? But does it matter? No. It's the effect that matters. Give the best you have and it will never be enough, which is also true. But give your best anyway. Because in the final analysis, it is between you and God. It will never work between you and them anyway. 
it is always between us and God. In the end, when we get to heaven at the judgment gate, you'll just be asked, how much have you loved? They're not going to ask you how many degrees you have, or how many church organizations you become president of, or whatever, not how many churches you build, no, nothing like that. That's all. St. John on the cross wrote that in the evening you will be judged, you will be examined by love. That's it. So, ultimately, to keep ourselves sane, just keep in mind the love of God that is within us because from that, our actions will always be guided by the love of God and we will not put ourselves or give ourselves unnecessary stress or uh, anxiety over the things that we cannot control or the people that we don't like or the people who drive us crazy. I mean, Jesus, a lot of people don't like Jesus, but he loved them anyway. We are not Jesus yet, but we are called to be like him. So this is something that can help us to find our sanity and center ourselves to God. Okay, so this is uh, what I have to share for this evening. Um, I hope that uh, it has um, given us some food for thought. Thank no? you, Father. It was uh, very insightful, very captivating. The Holy Spirit is really upon us tonight. It was a grace-filled, grace-filled talk. Thank you so much. Feel very blessed tonight. Thank you.